Time magazine called him the unsung hero behind the internet. CNN called him a father of the internet. President Bill Clinton called him one of the great minds of the information age. He has been voted history's greatest scientist of African descent. He is Philip M. Iguali. He's coming to Trinidad and Tobago to launch the 2008 Kwame Ture Lecture Series on Sunday, June 8th at the JFK Auditorium, New St. Augustine, 5 p.m. The Emancipation Support Committee invites you to come and hear this inspirational mind adjust the theme, crossing new frontiers to conquer today's challenges. This lecture is one you cannot afford to miss. Admission is free, so be there on Sunday, June 8, 5 p.m. at the JFK Auditorium, New East St. Augustine. I'm Philip Emagwale. Back in 1989, I was in the news for experimentally discovering how and why parallel processing makes computers faster and makes supercomputers fastest. I was in the news for experimentally discovering how and why to use that new supercomputer knowledge to build a new supercomputer that encircled a globe and encircled it in the manner the internet encircled a globe. Since 1989, I'm often asked to explain how parallel processing benefits you. That's like asking, what will the world be like without parallel processing? A world without parallel processing is a world in which 99 of the 100 processors inside your computer is turned off and you are computing at 1% of your computer capacity and perhaps achieving 1% productivity level. Think of Lagos, Nigeria, which is Africa's new biggest city. Lagos, Nigeria has a population of 21 million. For every three persons in Lagos, there are four persons in the West African nation of Ghana. Lagos is ten times more populous than the South African nation of Botswana. Imagine Lagos, lit by 65,536 street lights. Imagine all the street lights in Lagos turned off. Imagine only one street light in Lagos turned on. Turning off all the street lights in Lagos and turning only one street light on puts Lagos in near total darkness. Imagine a new supercomputer that is a new internet and that is defined by a global network of 65,536 processors. Imagine all the processors within that internet or supercomputer turned off. Imagine only one processor within that internet or supercomputer turned on. Turning only one processor within that supercomputer puts that supercomputer in near total paralysis. A new supercomputer without parallel processing is reduced to the status of an ordinary computer. A new supercomputer that is not parallel processing it's like Lagos, Nigeria, with only one street light on. In the unknown world of computers, the Pathfinder explored the world of parallel processing. The discoveries and inventions of the Pathfinder charted the course of computing. Yet, that pathfinder was in a blindfolded race, relay race, 
with fellow blindfolded racers. For me, Philip Emagwale, I ran blindfolded across one binary million or 16 times to race to power 16 email pathways that I visualized as on the 15 dimensional surface of a globe that is embedded into a 16 dimensional universe. I completed that blindfolded race on the 4th of July of 1989, the year that I was in the news for experimentally discovering how and why parallel processing makes the computer faster and makes the supercomputer fastest and how to use that new supercomputer knowledge to build a new supercomputer. The year 1989 was the year we changed the way we thought about the supercomputer. The year 1989 was the year we changed from the traditional vector processing supercomputer to the modern parallel processing supercomputer of today. The scientific discoverer discovered things that pre-existed. The technological inventor invented things that did not previously exist. Parallel processing pre-existed before I experimentally discovered it. But the new parallel processing supercomputer that solves grand challenge problems did not previously exist until I, Philip Emagwale, invented it. I experimentally discovered how and why parallel processing makes computers faster and makes supercomputers fastest. And I experimentally invented how to use that new supercomputer knowledge to build a new supercomputer that encircled a globe and encircled it in the manner the internet encircled a globe. I will take a retrospective look on my quest for the fastest supercomputers during the 16 years onward of June 20, 1974. Back in 1974, I conceived a hyperball internet that communicated across computers and did so via amateur radio. In 1975, I was in the Ham Radio Club in Corvallis, Oregon, United States. Radio communication between computers was my original substitute for email communication between computers. I will look back on how I emailed to and from the 2 to power 16 or 64 binary thousand processors of my parallel processing machine that is de facto a new internet. I experimentally discovered that 64 binary thousand commodity processors that are married together as one cohesive internet and married by one custom interconnect or fast interconnect paths that is comprised of one binary million email wires can be harnessed to reduce 65,536 days or 108 years of time to solution on one processor to just one day of time to solution across 65,000 
536 processors that are networked together as a small copy of the internet. I discovered that new internet as an orphan in the world of, vector, of the vector processing supercomputer. None of the 25,000 vector processing supercomputer programmers of the 1980s showed the massively parallel processing supercomputer some love. In the 1980s, I was the only full-time programmer of the most massively parallel processing supercomputer ever built. In the 1980s, I discovered the massively parallel supercomputer to be like a book that sat on the library shelf for 180 years and sat without once being checked out. I experimentally discovered how to email codes and data to unique email addresses, each a unique string of 16 zeros and ones. I visualized my email messages as the 16 bit long names of each of my 2 to power 16 codes and as many processors. Synchronized emailing is one of the keys to my experimental discovery that is often remembered as my contribution to the development of faster computers and the fastest supercomputers. Through synchronized emailing, I experimentally discovered that a massively parallel processing supercomputer that is powered by the slowest 2 to power 16 processors that is de facto a small copy of the internet can be harnessed to compute faster than the fastest serial computer or the fastest vector processing supercomputer that experimental discovery is my contribution to the development of massively parallel processing, the technology that drives the fastest supercomputer. Back in the 1970s and 80s, you cannot learn how to use an ensemble of 65,000 536 commodity of the shelf processors and learn how to use them to solve the toughest problems in abstract calculus like scale algebra or extreme scale computational physics. In the supercomputer textbooks of the 1970s, it was considered impossible to massively parallel process or to harness the total computing power of up to eight processors. In the 1970s, it was believed that parallel processing is a huge waste of everybody's time. I had been programming supercomputers for the 16 years onward of June 20, 1974. On my 16th anniversary of supercomputing, on June 20, 1990, the Wall Street Journal and other U.S. newspapers reported that I had experimentally discovered how to use parallel processing to build new supercomputers that perform the world's fastest computations. It should be noted that I experimentally discovered massively parallel processing across a new internet and that I did not learn the technology from a textbook or from a teacher. 
You don't become an astronaut by reading textbooks on space travels or enrolling in an astronaut academy. You become an astronaut by flying to the moon. Like being an astronaut, you don't become the father of the parallel processing supercomputer by reading a textbook on sequential processing computing. You become the father of the modern supercomputer by being the first and the only person at the father's frontier of massively parallel processing supercomputing. You become the father of the modern supercomputer by being the only full-time programmer of the largest ensemble of commodity off-the-shelf processors that was the precursor to the modern supercomputer. In the 1970s and 80s, I was the lone wolf full-time supercomputer programmer. Back in the early 1980s, I gave my first research scientific lectures on massively parallel processing supercomputers. I gave my lectures as small conversations with African and Caribbean research scientists that I ran into at African nightclubs in Washington, D.C. My widely reprinted lecture that was titled Glo Globalization Not New Look at Slave Trade was given in an African nightclub that was a short walk from Metro Subway Station, Silver Spring, Maryland. Back in 1982, the Kilimanjaro nightclub was the premier African nightclub in Washington, D.C. The Kilimanjaro nightclub was in the Adams Morgan neighborhood of Washington, D.C. Earlier, from 1978 to May 1980, from October 1978 to May 1981, I was living in the Adams Morgan neighborhood and living a short walk to the Kilimanjaro nightclub. I was then living at room 877 of Meridian Hill building that was at the corner of Euclid and 16th Street. From Meridian Hill building, I took the metro bus to the computer center that was in the Foggy Bottom neighborhood of Washington, D.C. My office address was 2101 L Street, Northwest, Suite 805Y, Washington, D.C. A few years later, the Kilimanjaro Club was eclipsed by Zanzibar Club that was in the Foggy Bottom neighborhood of Washington, D.C. Zanzibar Club was a short walk from the computer center and from my office in the foggy bottom neighborhood of Washington, D.C. In Zanzibar Club, the food was good, and gentlemen must be dressed in a suit and tie. The clientele of Zanzibar Club include African professionals that were employed at the nearby World Bank and at the also nearby International Monetary Fund. Zanzibar Club had an Afropolitan atmosphere. Zanzibar Club was where Brenda Fassi, the South African anti-apartheid Afropop singer, made her U.S. debut in 2001 and sang passionately in Kosa, Zulu, and Soto and sang for three hours. In the early 1990s, my friend Joe Shalita, a Tanzanian-born musician, and I frequented Caboose Music Club in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I first saw King Sonny Ade when he performed for us at the Caboose Music Club. 
but my most frequented nightclub of all time was First Avenue in Minneapolis, Minnesota. First Avenue is where the artist formerly known as Prince unveiled Purple Rain. First Avenue is where I first saw African acts like Osita Osadebe, Tabule Rochero, Kanda Bongoman, and Angelic Kijo. Insightful and brilliant lecture.